Good evening, everyone. We're just letting a few more in from the waiting room before we start. Okay, we'll make a start then. You're all very welcome this evening and welcome to Prony Events for the fourth annual DA Chart Seminar on Maps. Dr. Chart was Prony's first Deputy Keeper of the Records, leading the organisation from 1923 until 1948, and expanded Prony's archives by encouraging the donation of important landed estate records, including maps. He also encouraged links with map collections across Britain and Ireland. Our speakers this evening work within the National Archives of the United Kingdom, a national organization which has remained our key archival partner since Chart's leadership. Our first speaker, Rose Mitchell, has long been map archivist at the National Archives and an historian of cartography. She is co-author of Maps, Their Untold Stories, 2014 from Bloomsbury, and has published and presented on a range of map-related topics, including international boundaries, overseas and military mapping, sea charts, landscape and architectural history. Her specialism is in early modern maps. She is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and a trustee with the J.B. Harley Trust for International Research Fellowships in the History of Cartography. Our second speaker this evening, Dr. Lucia Heriar Pardo, apologies Lucia for that pronunciation, is Senior Conservator um, Scientist at the Collection Care Department of the National Archives, where she provides scientific support for conservation projects and researches the TNA collection from a material perspective. She uses multiple techniques to characterize the archival collections, such as multispectral imaging and fiber optic reflectance, to name but only two, and I'm sure she'll reveal so many other scientific tricks. With a background in both chemistry and art history, she completed her PhD in heritage science in 2015. I encourage you all to place your questions in the chat function during the presentation, and we will address as many as we can at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rose um, for the presentation on early Irish maps at the National Archives. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much to Glyn and the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland for this invitation to talk about our maps depicting Ireland. So I'm going to give the archival context for our early Irish maps and show both the well known and those perhaps less familiar. We'll look at why these maps were made, for which places and what they show what we know about some of those who made them and how they were used and kept. And we will return to look in closer detail at some of these uh, maps that you see here. So as an overview, maps at the National Archives, um, these Irish maps lie within one of the largest map holdings in the world, ranging in date from the 14th century to 20 or 30 years ago, um, and in place there's worldwide coverage in scale ranging from maps of the world, of countries, of counties, down to those of just a few fields. And there are rather a large number, you know, we think perhaps six million plus, and they are accruing 
all the time. So that's just um, a word of context. And there are far more from the 18th century onwards once printing became more common. So within this context, any manuscript Tudor maps are noteworthy. And this evening, we'll be looking at a remarkable cache of these dating from about 1560 to 1610. There are around 100 of these early Irish maps in the National Archives, which as the great Irish map historian John Andrews noted, has more maps of Ireland from this period than any other repository. That's from his article on the John, John Norden maps of um, Ireland. So why is this? Maps reflect the values and preoccupations of their creators and the historic context in which they were drawn. Ireland was the first step in England's westward expansion overseas from the late 16th century, a time when statesmen across Europe were starting to use maps in what has been termed a rise in map consciousness. So requests for the relatively new tool of maps displaying the Irish landscape increasingly issued from the corridors and gilded chambers of power at the Royal Court in England during the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I. These maps illustrated affairs of state and are found in the State Papers Ireland, the archives of secretaries of state containing dispatches from the Crown's representative in Ireland, the Lord Deputy or Lord Lieutenant and his officials. The maps were working documents sent with relevant papers from Ireland to London to inform and influence decisions at the highest levels. They allowed statesmen in London to visualize lands in Ireland, the focus of much government business in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. As maps of state affairs, they may show a high level of presentation like this map of Tralee Bay and Manor with color and framing. The title in an elaborate cartouche, this decorative box for the title. The dividers over a scale bar point to the map maker's professional skill in making map scale a new technique. If decoration expresses a viewpoint, the dividers beyond their practical utility in allowing measurement of places on the map can perhaps be seen as symbolic of a wish to pin down this landscape or an idea that it was measurable and so knowable. How were these maps kept? Early Irish maps are found in the National Archives nowadays in three places. Firstly, as extracted maps from decorated volumes in State Papers Ireland Maps, the record series SB64, like John Goff's famous map Hibernia, we see here, which we'll see more of, more of later. Secondly, they can appear as extracted maps from correspondence volumes in State Papers Ireland, the record series SP63, the main record of government in early modern Ireland, and the map of Tralee Bay, which you'll now recognise is one of these. These maps were extracted as part of a policy for their better preservation, as usually they're larger than the volumes in which they were originally kept. So thirdly, smaller maps may still be found in situ with correspondence in State Papers Island. To look more closely at these, State Papers Island maps, SB64, were originally kept in three volumes with a set of related letters. The 68 maps date from 1600 to 1609 and were bound in vellum. Here are the covers of one of the volumes and some of the maps it contained. Among them are well-known maps, and here's the Goff map again, and, and many of them are coloured and um, highly decorated. And yet there are also pen and ink sketches amongst them, such as, such as these. 
and they equally communicated diplomatic matters. The covers were embossed with the gilded royal coat of arms, communicating power as these maps were destined to be seen at the highest levels of Elizabeth's court. The volumes were disbound in the 1920s and the maps put into portfolios and given extracted map references by which they're still known. Then in the 1990s, exact fac facsimiles were made for the map reading room and the originals placed in the safe room. In 2010, they were digitized and made available online. So the importance accorded to these maps is thus clear throughout their complex archival history. If we turn to perhaps a less well-examined source, around 35 maps are found in State Papers Ireland, sent to London with letters and reports, among which they may still lie, or larger maps were extracted. The title of this series doesn't mention maps, so it is unsurprising that these have um, been less often looked at. This map of County Kerry is still in situ, bound in the original correspondence volume with which it was kept, with a letter dated 1573 requesting supplies of munitions. So here is the map and the letter is on the preceding page. Here is the letter. Um, requesting munitions, is particularly arrows, um, and here is the endorsement on the back of the map, the plot of the county of Kerry. By contrast with the rather ornate presentation of the State Papers map volumes, these volumes, just of State Papers Ireland, um, have board covers, ordinary board covers, um, and their, their titles are rather worn, the title on the spine here. The presentational style of the map is more workaday too, with construction details such as uh, this grid enabling drawing of the landforms left visible, which of course is very interesting for us today in terms of the history of cartography, seeing how the maps are made. So what do these early Irish maps show? They depict plantations, fortifications, and townships in Ireland. And several maps show the whole of Ireland and are amongst the earliest cartographic representations of the country. As we see here, North may not be at the top of early maps. So here's North. And uh, to get to our usual view of, of Ireland, we have to crane our necks rather. This map of 1567 by John Goff entitled Hibernia was drawn from the viewpoint of England, which is shown down here. Actually, that is England. This is Wales and that's Scotland. So it can be seen as reflecting an English view of a land across the water where sea monsters played. Here they are suggesting perhaps that this was territory previously unmapped and unknown to its remote English rulers. And yet it could be named, drawn and therefore colonized. To look at a few details here, wonderful ships, you could actually construct um, the ship almost from, from these. And you've also got the sailors in the rigging. Um, so immensely detailed drawings, but note here the notes written across the several hands here by administrators. This is very much a government business document, not just a map to go on the wall. So the kind of detail in the interior, um, as well as obviously ports, is really of um, defensive interest. So you've got um, obstacles for armies, such as these mountains and locks and, and bogs. I'm showing this particular item to show this annotation, which is in the hand of Sir William Cecil, later Lord Burley, Queen Elizabeth I's chief advisor, who had a keen interest in cartography. So along with the other statesmen, he in particular wrote notes on the maps, which crossed his desk about strategically important places and also locations of those loyal or enemies to the English. 
Burley also made maps such as this one of parts of Ireland sketched on the back of a letter he had been sent. So you can see this is the endorsement for the letter and uh, he's, uh, he's uh, sketched this on, on the back of that. Annalie Margay's article in Imago Mundi about this map notes that it shows places. So we have Munster here and there's a coastline and some rivers. And it also names chiefs. So here's the Earl of Tyrone. Cecil clearly drew this map for himself to lay out the main threats he'd been told about. He never went to Ireland. So this shows what he recalled from maps he had seen in his many years of dealing with Irish affairs. But province level, this map of Munster on the left here, drawn in 1580, it shows place names, rivers, forests, buildings and elevation, particularly castles. Again, the kinds of things that were of interest. But I've shown this because I think it is a like in style to some local maps of places in England of the same period, especially with regard to features like the cardinal points. Um, in capitals here on the Irish map. And this is a map of Yorkshire and one of Essex. Um, so there's, a, there's quite a similarity and the general style and colouring and also the scale bars with the dividers across. This is from a map of Norfolk and a map of Dorset. These are examples um, from English maps from the 1580s and, and 90s. And I think they do bear quite a big um, comparison. Many of the maps depict wider areas such as baronies and plantations and there's a series of barony maps which are among our most famous images. Thought to have been drawn by Sir Josias Bodley and his team for the commission of 1609 to plant Ulster. These maps are noted by Andrews, Margay and others to be the first to give a detailed view of the landscape of the province and enable division of lands for estates. These manuscript maps were designed for presentation to James I and are brightly coloured, framed by borders with decorative strapwork cartouches. And each has an empty cartouche, which I've actually filled with my title here. And it, this was left, we think, for a series title for the survey, which the map maker ran out of time to create. This map entitled Barony's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so this map is entitled the Barony of Clawher. And it shows place names. You've got churches and hills and quite a lot of woodland. And I did want to make the point that some of these maps have actually enabled um, a claim for ancient woodland status um, due to their evidence of wooded areas um, going back in, in historic time. So um, there's actually been quite you know, recent, um, recent use of these maps. Um, for a modern historic purpose. This map was also made for presentation, although this does come from State Papers Ireland. So we've got the color, the elaborate scale bar. Um, so the map, start, the map style is not defined by source. This shows the baronies of Farney and Clan Carroll, and it was made for the Earl of Essex to show lands that he'd been granted, these ones in pink, um, to distinguish them from those of his neighbours in, in, in green. So it doesn't show much detail of the interior, really, um, but it, it, it's just to lay out um, the, lands, the land grant. This topographical map of the barony of Idrome was perhaps by an English map maker and military engineer, Robert Lythe, although John Andrews thought it might be a copy. But whoever made it, the highly finished formal style with hills in relief and quite sophisticated portrayal of rivers and woodlands make it seem perhaps an inspiration for J.R.R. R. Tolkien's imaginary lands. We turn now to maps showing smaller areas. 
This model plan for a plantation town was made presumably for mooted landscape manipulation in the English colonization process. The settlement is shown on a square divided into plots with a regular road pattern leading to a church here, houses sited in a mirroring pattern, except for this chimneyed manor house labeled the gentleman's domain. Town plans were more often based on reality, such as this bird's eye view of Limerick, surrounded by a moat with defended bridges and betowered uh, city walls and castle and church, and a waterfront with a water gate uh, and ships. We think this may have been drawn by Francis Jobson, and this was originally held within those gilded parchment cupboards. So not everything there was heavily decorated, yet all were useful business records. This map of Port Rush was originally in those gilded parchment covers, but despite the prominent scale bar and the decorative compass rows, the draftsmanship is perhaps less sophisticated, more of drawing. So if you look at the ship here, with oars and the flag. Among the houses at the top in the hills uh, appear bearded people. So here's one and another, along with wolves. So there's one here and one here, and rabbits and uh, rabbits fairly prominent and, and goats, etc. So this all makes for an extraordinary individualistic depiction, this is very much a one-off. The defensive element of towns was often captured by multiple images for the same place, such as a set of three plans of Newry made by Robert Lythe in 1568. So here's part of a map which shows the situation of the town within its walls, the houses sort of spilling out here, and the location of the castle fairly centrally here. Then there's a plan um, which shows the internal detail of the castle with spiral staircases and windows. I think this is perhaps a privy here and a perspective view of the doors and windows and the chimneys etc and also the the crenellations etc. So all together they give um, quite useful um, different views of the same same place. The Nine Years' War from 1594 gave rise to a wave of more overt military map making, such as this map of the province of Ulster, which the reference table says shows the disposition of an army of 11,000, here's the 11,000, across several strategic places. Forts and ships are shown with flags, so here. And notes on the map refer to military commanders. This was enclosed in a report by Francis Jobson and may have been drawn by him. There are also depictions of fortifications, uh, such as this view of the strong castle of Burt. And we're told it had five pieces of artillery. Well, I can only count four here. So presumably the fifth was round the back somewhere. There are also notes about its site um, on a hill um, near the sea. It was sent in a letter by Captain Covert to William Cecil in May 1601. But military maps may not just be um, showing sites on land. Here's Merrick recorded to, um, because there was a, a siege by Spanish and Italian forces. So you can see their flanks here. And uh, the English ships had drawn up in formation. And this is actually portraying them firing upon the, the, the enemies there. Um, you can see here the names of the ships and, and how they're firing. It's thought to have been drawn by William Winter, an admiral present at the time. So it does perhaps portray his version of events. So that's a brief overview of early Irish maps in the National Archives and how they were originally viewed and used. 
their style and materials varies in a way that is comparable with English maps of a similar date and also a reflection of the many hands that made them. This slide, and I thank Lucia for, uh, for compiling it, this summarises what we know about some of the nine makers of our maps and when they worked, including William Winter. So there's Go John Goff, Robert Lythe, William Winter, Francis Jobson, Josiah Spodley, John Norden, and Lucia will be talking especially about Richard Bartlett. So I will now hand over to Lucia, who will present the findings on the materiality of some of these maps. So we will be virtually getting under their skin. Her fascinating research deepens our understanding of map making materials and methods in this period. Thank you. Over to Lucia. Thank you, Rose. That was fantastic. I will now share my screen. Um... Okay, I'll just make it full screen. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Um, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for watching this talk today. I'm going to present the results of our research into the materials and techniques used by an extraordinary Tudor map maker, Richard Bartlett, and I will compare his practice with that of other early modern map makers also working in Ireland. Um, so to start, let me introduce the project. The previous research on maps materiality and painted heritage of Ireland and then present the research questions we are trying to address. Um, so how did it all start? Um, first not, note that the approach for this project is that of heritage science or technical art history. You might not be familiar with those disciplines and that's because they are relatively new. Um, and basically uh, the use scientific methods and new technologies to interrogate cultural heritage from the point of view of its materiality. So we are going to look at maps as artifacts, as archaeologists would do. Um, so by doing this, we try to address research questions related to, for instance, artist techniques, um, questions around authorship, um, influences among makers, and cultural exchange, dating of objects based on the materials identify, also important questions around authentication of items, um, current condition, conservation problems, or questions around their future preservation. Um, so my interest in Tudor and Stuart map making in Ireland was prompted by a reader's request at the National Archives. And I think she's among the audience, so I'm very excited that, that she has joined us. Uh, this evening. Um, she was a student from Queen's University Belfast doing her PhD and also a filmmaker. So some of you might have seen her documentary about um, the mapping of Ireland. Um, and she was working on a project about Richard Bartlett um, as an artist. So from the perspective of his practice um, as a draft man and, and color man. Um, so she wanted to understand his process and the materials that he was using. And Serendipitously, she found out about um, our laboratory for material analysis and I provided scientific support by analyzing the three regional maps by Richard Bartlett kept at, at the National Archives. Um, I have recently found out that she has successfully completed her project in 2022. Um, so you, you can find out more uh, perhaps later in the discussion. Um, so I take the chance to thank her for making me discover Bartlett's work. After that case study, uh, the project grew into a contextualization of Bartlett's practice uh, within his time period. Uh, and we were lucky enough to get some funding from the Arts and Humanities Research Council and collaborated with Notting Nottingham Trent University to apply um, artificial intelligence uh, and make the data processing more efficient, which allowed me to analyze more maps by other map makers. Um, after that project, my conclusion was that Bartlett was actually extraordinary. Um, and I decided to expand the research on his work by traveling to the National Library of Ireland uh, with some of our portable instruments of analysis. And I spent two weeks there analyzing non-invasively uh, 12 more maps and plans by Bartlett.
Um, so when I did some bibliographic research on the topic, I realized that very little work had been done on the material analysis of maps. And in this slide, I'm, I'm showing the few projects I, I have managed to find, all based in the UK and one in Germany. And as you see, the oldest project dates only from 2016. So it's a very recent trend. Most projects are actually case studies that focus on a single iconic map, such as the Selden map of China, the Hereford map Amundi, and the Gov map, um, with the exception of the recent project by the University of Hamburg, where they systematically analyze maps collections from both Europe and Asia. And I invite you to explore their website if you want to find out more. And there are also some publications by the, by the other um, I, um, British teams working on the analysis of maps. Um, so looking specifically at Irish materials, no maps of Ireland have been analysed before and actually very little scientific analysis of pigments and colorants has been undertaken more broadly on other painted media from Ireland, such as illuminated manuscripts. Uh, recently, th though, two very important projects on manuscripts must be noted. Since, 20, um, since 2009, the Trinity College Dublin has been analysing the materials of early medieval Irish manuscripts, including the Book of Kells, with the support of MOLAB, a MOLAB laboratory for, cal for cultural heritage funded by the European Research Infrastructure for Cultural for Heritage Science. And more recently, the University College Cork um, has been undertaking the, um, the Inks and Skins project. Again, I invite you to visit the website if you want to find out more anchoring their work on the book of Uy Main, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, a 14th century manuscript produced in Galway. Um, interestingly, interestingly, the National Gallery of Ireland uh, is currently recruiting a heritage scientist. So in the next few years, we will certainly see more materiality research on Irish collections. Um, so Specifically, the research questions that we were trying to answer with the analysis of these early modern works on paper were um, what materials and, te and techniques were the map makers using in, in Tudor and early Stuart Ireland? What was the origin of these materials? Were they local or imported? Were they obtained in Ireland or brought from England? Were they common or expensive and imported? Uh, from abroad, from far away, um, and also questions around the production context. How did Barlett's practice compare to other map makers of the period? Are there influences between them or did they work in isolation? Um, can we find trends in their use of materials uh, for early map making uh, or perhaps uh, particularities of a specific map maker that can be used for attribution of unknown uh, maps. Um, so to this end, as I introduced before, we adopted the approach of technical art history, combining material analysis with investigation of documentary sources, um, such as uh, historic painting treatises or documentation on pigment trade of the period. Um, this was inspired by recent projects, such as Miniare in Cambridge University, of which I was lucky enough to, to uh, participate, um, where large and relevant groups of illuminated manuscripts were analyzed by an interdisciplinary team of scientists and art historians and also medievalists. Or also a recent exhibition at the French National Archives where map makers are valued and studied uh, as artists. And as you can see there on the screen, the, that was the poster of the exhibition. Um, so let's move on to the materials that we have analyzed. Um, I won't give you much context because I think um, uh, Rose has given a fantastic uh, contextualization of the collection. Um, so I will only say that uh, the maps uh, I'm going to present, most of them were extracted from, uh, as Rose presented, the series SP state paper 63 and 64. And I want to draw, the, draw your attention to this letter that was sent from um, Sir Thomas Richway, Treasurer of Ireland, to Robert Cecil, Secretary of State in London, asking for advice about how to distribute the confiscated lands in Ireland to the noblemen that were loyal to the crown. And enclosed to this letter were some of the maps I'm going to show you, including Bartlett's and Bodley's maps. And interestingly, interestingly in, the ma in the letter, uh, it said that these maps are for His Majesty's view specifically. So we can perhaps uh, 
understand that the maps were the function of the maps was for presentation to uh, to the king and his entourage of high high level civil servants and that's why they are so lavishly decorated and so colorful um so um as Rose said, the National Archives holds 60 Tudor maps of Ireland, including four by Richard Bartlett, as you see on the slide. Um, the earliest, shown on top, is a depiction of Lochnia in July 1601. It's unornamented and rapidly drawn with ink on parchment, um, perhaps because it wasn't made for the Lord Deputy, but for a subordinate commander, Sir Arthur Chichester. Then we have uh, the three famous regional maps uh, dedicated to Montjoy. Uh, and closely related to each other. As you see, they share the same format, style, and color range. Um, they are um, presented chronologically, left to right. Um, so we have uh, the southeast part of Ulster um, on the left one, as, and it, it is known as the campaign map because it shows all the English army's movements in Ulster during 1602. The second one is a general description of Ulster, uh, and it uses a smaller scale, it's more neutral and academic geographical portrait. Um, and the latest map is the so-called base map, likely made after the death, the death of Elizabeth I in March 1603, as her royal arms are absent. And this is again a neutral map representing the northwest coast of Ulster. Um, then, um, as I mentioned, I visited the National Library of Ireland, where I managed to analyze 12 more maps. Um, all part of MS 2656, 26, featuring maps and, and plans for towns and fortifications in various counties. Uh, it also contains plans of structures such as Dublin Castle and maps depicting military encampments during the Nine Years' War. The maps came to the National Library of Ireland in uh, 1956, following a, a serendipitous resurfacing in London. And finally, I, I managed to squeeze one visit to uh, Trinity College Dublin and analyze this map, which is quite early dated in uh, 1601. Um, then once I have characterized um, Bartlett's maps, as I mentioned, I thought it was very interesting to put it in context and compare it with the practice and materials used by other map makers. Um, so I analyzed 10 more maps by eight other map makers spanning six decades, as you see on the slide. Um, so moving on to the methodology, I will now present the analytical techniques that I used for this investigation. All of them are non-invasive, which means that no samples are needed, not even contact with the surface of the maps. So are, they are very respectful with the, with the objects, which is important for us. Um, so the first thing I normally do is to gather information about the spatial distribution of the materials through multispectral imaging. Um, this is a camera that has been modified to be able to acquire images beyond the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can also acquire images using ultraviolet illumination as well as infrared uh, radiation. And those th that technique reveals different features of the materials. For instance, fluorescence that is characteristic of some organic dyes or looking at how the pigments change color can already give you an indication of the potential materials that might be um, making that pigment. Um, then through the collaboration with Nottingham Trent University, uh, we applied um, um, AI to the, to the set of spectral images. Um, it's called a self-organizing map um, and it's an unsupervised clustering of the data extracted from those spectral images. Um, there are some publications if you want to know more details. And um, basically this is what the results look like. Um, so we have the visible image, the, the color map on the left, and then the next image is the cluster map. So basically areas that share similar material composition will appear in the same color. Um, and then the, a very helpful feature is that we can extract individual clusters of materials that share the same composition. And this can be done within a map, but also across maps. So if we image 60 maps, we could track the presence of a material across all of those. As you can imagine, this is incredibly, incredibly helpful um, 
as a guidance to then select those spots of interest to analyze uh, with ad additional techniques. And basically what we achieve with this approach is to optimize the time of the analysis and investigate larger series and collections in the same amount of time. So we can be more ambitious instead of focusing on a, a single object or a few, a few maps. So once we have done this initial imaging and clustering of the um, materials present in the maps, we would do some point analysis with uh, complementary techniques. Some of these techniques will inform us about uh, the elemental composition of the materials. So the chemical elements, copper, lead, mercury, uh, and these techniques, this technique is called X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy, and is helpful for inorganic materials, such as inorganic pigments, the substrates for uh, lake pigments, inks, um, metal ink like gold, um, uh, so it's helpful for that kind of materials. As you will see, the techniques we are using are complementary. They provide um, the different pieces of the puzzle that then we can um, put together and interpret. Um, another set of techniques that we normally use to analyze the maps non-invasively provide us with molecular composition. So instead of informing us about the elements, say copper, uh, we would find we will find information about the actual compounds, chemical compounds, so a copper carbonate, for instance. So it's even more precise about the identity of the materials we have in our collections. And the techniques um, that I used were micro Raman spectroscopy, which is fantastic for inorganic pigments. Uh, then something called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy that tell us about the map substrate. So whether it's a paper or um, parchment, also the substrates for the lakes and some pigments can also be identified with this technique. Um, and finally, fiber optic reflectance spectroscopy or force as we call it, that is interesting because can detect some organic dyes non-invasively, which is something quite hard to do. So, so it's a very helpful technique as well in combination with the, with the other ones. Um, and you have pictures of what they look like. Normally they are kind of pistols, handheld instruments that you can um, place on a tripod or gently a uh, few millimeters from the surface and acquire the, the information, the signals from the, um, from the sample, from the items underneath. And finally, something very basic, but incredibly informative is to do microscopy. So to have a look at the surface of the maps under magnification. And we normally use these tiny USB microscopes that we can plug in our laptops and they can go up to 200 magnification. So they are, they're incredibly helpful. And you can use them with visible, but also ultraviolet light to look at particular phenomenon such as luminescence of some materials. Uh, so let's move swiftly, swiftly to the results and I have organized the results, let's, let's say by layers, so from the substrate and going upwards. So uh, in terms of the substrates of the maps, 25 of, of them were made on uh, laid paper and only two on parchment, which actually uh, has the potential for DNA and proteomic analysis, but that's not something that we do on site. Um, the dimensions of the maps uh, range, but for instance, Bartlett's work is normally quite standard, so either folio or bifolio. And sometimes we have several sheets of paper glued together to create more like, larger or less standard um, dimensions, like more, more, more like landscape rectangular ones. We have signs of folding, like the, uh, the folds and some pigment transferred from one half of the map to the other one that has been in contact, some pinholes that show that the maps have been displayed on a wall sometimes. And interestingly, uh, we managed to get good images of the watermarks using transmitted light. And Bartlett and Bodley's maps uh, always show the same watermark. They, it, it shows that they were using the same source of paper and it's normally a bunch of grapes or either a single or a double bunch of grapes. Um, this has been connected to the Dublin Castle uh, and also some high level documents in, in London, including a, a letter by Elizabeth I. So perhaps the, the paper were, were, was supplied by, um, by the Crown before they traveled to Ireland. Uh, there are many good online watermark databases that can be searched for and compared with the uh, watermark seen in the maps, and that helps uh, attributing the origin of the paper, like uh, in Belgium or France, and more or less uh, check if the, if the date coincides. 
then the next thing we can look at is the preparatory sketches because the um, uh, infrared images reveal what's underneath the paint layer. So if, if the drawing was made with a carbon-based material, um, it, it becomes quite dark in the infrared images. So we can see more clearly some um, grid lines. Um, I'm highlighting them in orange, as you can see. Uh, and same for ruling lines for text. Um, some details on how the decorative elements were constructed, such as the ships, um, and also some corrections of the composition, what in Italian is called pentimenti. So I don't know if you can see there clearly on the screen, but I have highlighted an area where the ship was moved and, and eventually drawn in a different location. Um, then in terms of inks, iron gold was the most common ink. Um, for both for text and drawing, uh, including the shading of some elements like the mountains with cross hatching. Uh, it was interesting to see that in some cases I found impurities in the iron gold ink, such as zinc or copper, uh, which can be due to impurities in the um, ingredients to make the iron gold ink, such as the iron vitriol, or perhaps to contamination from the metal containers uh, where the ink was kept that could have been made in brass. Um, there's also um, gold ink used for uh, some highlights in the high, higher status maps. So we have confirmed the purity of the gold ink used in those cases. Um, then some map makers have used um, in in few occasions other inks such as vermilion for the red ink and some carbon based inks, including the annotations by Lord Burley that normally are all made in in carbon ink. So that's a nice way of distinguishing sometimes what uh, what uh, annotations uh, have been added later because they will show different colors in the multispectral images as you can see there on the bottom. Uh, left that some ink appears black and other elements appear red because they have a different chemical composition. The binding media is always a bit of a mystery because it's very hard to determine without invasive techniques, without taking a sample, extracting the binding media and analyzing it with very sensitive techniques. But through historic literature, we can guess that they use gum as a binder for the pigments in the maps. Um, so similar to nowadays watercolors in terms of the technique. Uh, and this is the hardened sap of a species of the acacia tree. And normally they were, they, were, they were traded to Europe from the Middle East or Africa in Sudan. Um, through the analytical results, we couldn't see any signs of other potential binding media, such as lipids or proteins. Uh, so it is quite likely that it, it is a polysaccharide, such as a natural gum, as, as I was saying, um, gum arabic, for instance. But the problem is that the paper is also made of um, uh, polysaccharides, such as cellulose. So it would mask any signal coming from the binding media. Uh, and we won't, We are not willing to take samples um, at this stage. We prefer to keep the non-invasive approach. Moving on to the colorants, I will just very quickly um, like fly over those, and then we can discuss uh, with the conclusions and the interpretation of these of these results. So for the reds, uh, vermilion was commonly used. Um, this is a, a mercury sulfide, and it was used across all the maps, practically in every red area. Uh, orange hues were obtained with red lead, and Bartlett was using a red organic dye for shading of the uh, of the buildings, which is very interesting to achieve a more three-dimensional effect. Um, in some instances, the the black buildings um, have have proven to be a degradation product of red lead, which, which was prone to darkening. And when we look under the microscope, as you, as you can see on the microphotograph on the right, you can still see some orange particles mixed in. So this is not painted black on purpose, it's just degradation. Um, so originally it would have looked more like the one on the left. Um, then pinks and purples are very interesting because they are organic dyes, um, so extracted from insects and plants, um, and then precipitated on a um, lake substrate. So the extract of plants and, and insects would, would be a liquid. And in order to make it into a powdery pigment, this liquid will be precipitated onto a, um, an, or, an inorganic base like gypsum or chalk, for instance. So we have determined the components of gypsum by analysis. So we know these are lake pigments. Um, we have several uh, hypothesis for the specifically the type of um, 
uh, die, but again, it's something that we cannot determine without taking samples, and for now we are not willing to do that. Um, so the pinks could be either cochineal or kermes or lac. Uh, all of them are very expensive and imported. Uh, the purple could be a plant-based, such as turnsole, a lichen base such as orchil or some kind of berries or wood extracts uh, like logwood. So we know that all those were used in this time, time period. The blues are very interesting as well because we see an evolution in the, in the use of materials. So the earlier maps would use indigo or wood. So the, they are both uh, the same chemically, but indigo would be imported from India and wood would be grown uh, in Europe but it has less uh, coloring power um, than indigo. And also indigo was used for shading uh, in later maps on top of brighter um, blues to achieve uh, darker areas. Um, interestingly, Jobson was using, is the only map maker using smalt, which is a cobalt glass. And this is interesting because it could be perhaps a marker of the work of this map maker. Perhaps if we find smalt, we can guess that that's Jobson work. And then later map makers would use azurite, copper-based uh, blues that are much brighter. Um, or the inorganic, sorry, the synthetic version of azurite that is called blue verditer, but again, chemically they are the same. Uh, greens are copper-based as well, normally verdigris. Sometimes we find um, uh, the presence of chlorine, um, which might mean that they used a different recipe. And the turquoise hues normally were achieved with uh, azurite mixtures with a yellow um, dye. Um, yellow was often organic again, um, and it appears fluorescent under UV light, um, although it might be that the, the fluorescence of the paper is showing through because this is a very, very thin uh, wash. And again, we can say it's an organic dye, but to be sure of what exactly what, we would need to take a sample and analyze it with chromatographic techniques. So the hypothesis would be either weld or fast take or still the grain, which is made from backthorn berries. Um, so plant-based uh, yellows. Um, Bartlett again was doing something very interesting. He was using a, a warmer yellow that was um, arsenic based. It was an arsenic sulfide. So initially we thought about a mineral uh, such as realgar or orpiment that were commonly used at the time. But when we, when we did Raman spectroscopy, we could get a very precise fingerprint of the compound. And it turned out to be a very unusual, unusual synthetic arsenic glass. Um, and we, we could see some remains of the raw material that was roasted to make this glass, which was para realgar. So we learned a lot about the process of making this pigment. And the fascinating thing is that this pigment hasn't been found very often in artworks. And literally on the screen, I'm showing you every instance that has been identified to date. So ranging from Italian manuscripts to Dutch old paintings, polychrome sculpture, decorative, um, like this, um, designs for decorative textiles and some Japanese prints. These all use this synthetic arsenic sulfide glass. Um, so um, the conclusion is that Bartlett was using a very consistent palette with varied materials and quite sophisticated techniques. But there is one exception and is the Trinity College map, um, which as you can already see from the picture, it has a limited and duller palette. It's less nuanced, it's simpler as a technique. There are no glazes there, uh, no layers. Um, indigo is used instead of azurite for blues. Yellow ochre that is much more opaque, is less delicate than the organic dyes, um, the yellow I was showing before um, for, uh, for the yellow areas. And then again, vermilion and verdigris that are ubiquitous in, in these earliest maps. Uh, however, no pink, no orange or purple, no bright colors as he would use in, in his uh, later maps. Um, so what are the, the explanation for, for this um, inconsistency. It could be that it's an early map, so he was using a simpler palette uh, at the beginning of his career. It may be that he had limited access to materials at the beginning of his campaign in Ireland, or, or perhaps this, was left, this map was left inked, black and white, and it was colored later by someone else. And that would connect it with the other early map that we have at the National Archives that is shown at the bottom, bottom right. 
Um, another interesting anomaly in Bartlett's corpus of maps was this one, map number seven at the National Library of Ireland, which turned out to be a 20th century replica because we find anachronisms in the use of pigments, which were not synthesized before the mid 19th century. Um, so we found uh, zinc white, lithopone, chrome yellow, and cerulean blue. All of those didn't exist at, during Barlett's uh, lifetime. Uh, and talking to people in the um, National Library of Ireland, uh, we learned that the original map was actually lost in the 1950s. So this is uh, actually a replica from the 20th century. Uh, and finally, this is a, a summary of the materials identified in the maps um, presented chronologically. I don't want you to read all of that, but just following the color code, you can already extract some information. Um, so as you see on the left of the table, the earlier maps have a more limited color palette, uh, dull blue made of indigo, dark greens based on verdigris, vermilion for the reds and oranges, and the occasional detail in yellow or purple. But as we approached the turn to the 17th century with the maps by Jobson and more especially Bartlett, we can see how the color palette explodes and is expanded and it starts incorporating much brighter tones, such as vivid turquoise, strong pinks, deep purples made of organic dyes, and more intense azurite blues. Both Lee's Commission and Northern uh, continue with this trend of more colorful palettes. Bartlett also uses more complex and subtle painting techniques, such as transparent glazes, to create three-dimensional effects, as we saw. And his coloring is much more subtle than the one that that of the maps produced by Bodley's Commission, uh, which, despite showing a similar color scheme, it is applied in, in they apply the paint in plain opaque layers, so much less delicate than Bartlett's. So finally, to conclude, let's discuss a little bit what all this means. Um, so therefore, we know that Barlett was using a varied palette composed mostly of natural dyes extracted from plants or insects and synthetic inorganic pigments. Some of the materials he used were very expensive, as the gold or, or the imported dyes, like cochineal, fustic, or logwood. And some of his pigments were quite unusual, such as the synthetic arsenic sulfate glass. We also know that Bartlett's work was known by other cartographers and painters. Uh, for instance, we have John Norden's book, A Description of Ireland, that includes seven copies of plants of forts in Ulster by Bartlett, and the large scale oil painting in, of the siege of Kinsale at Trinity College Dublin, that is likely based on a Bartlett's map. Um, when we compare the materials identified in Barlet's maps with the recommendations found in some historical painting treatises of the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, I have listed some on the screen, um, we see that in general they are in agreement, which suggests that Barlet was aware of the artistic techniques of, of his time and um, he was using similar suppliers as other uh, painters. Um, the thorough analysis also helped us understand better the physical condition of the maps, some degradation processes and later modifications. For example, I was very interested by um, a patch, a paper patch that was added to correct some information in the area of Dun Dundalk Bay um, that I'm showing at the bottom, um, highlighted in red. Um, but considering the style and materials used in the patch, it seems to have been done by Barlett himself. The patch was slightly lifted so I could have a look with the microscope from the side, as you can see on the detail on the right. And the, the, the area under the patch was uncolored. So it seems to have been a correction done by Barlett uh, after drawing, but before coloring. Um, I'm, I'm, I would be very grateful if somebody in the audience has ideas of what this might mean. Um, it is interesting to note that Barlett worked in a transition period between the traditional palette and practice of the Middle Ages and this, the industrialization of the 18th century that will see the proliferation of artist color men with new pigments and ready-made paints like the water color cakes that we, we use nowadays. In between these two phases, Bartlett incorporates to his palette new pigments brought from the new world at the same time as the East India Company starts the first expeditions. And to illustrate this, I just wanted to show you the ge geographic spread of the materials likely present in Bartlett's maps. As you can see, it goes from the cochineal and logwood from Mexico, imported by the Spaniards in, in Europe, the fastic from South America, 
to gum arabic from Iran, indigo and lac from India, Mediterranean kermes, or plants grown locally in Britain, such as woad, weld, mother, or backthorn berries. Um, however, we could consider uh, a local supply of pigments in Ireland, because we know that they were probably sold by apothecaries in Dublin, uh, as in other cities across Europe. Indeed, pigments were also used for medicinal purposes, and evidence from a 2018 archaeological ex excavation in Dublin found evidence of a 17th century apothecary shop with leptin yellow, a uh, yellow pigment, found in, in the vessels, and four oyster shells used for mixing the pigments. Uh, John Cunningham suggests a shop might have belonged to Jack of Rickman, a Dutchman, um, and may have been located on Bride Street or, or, or Golden Lane, which is significant. Uh, located just behind Dublin Castle, it held many surgeons and apothecaries, and in Colourman, uh, and Colourman later in the 18th century. Pigments and dyes were traded ac across Europe, yet archival documents which detail their trade in the 17th century in our Ireland are rare. Um, the Bristol trade records from for 1594-95 um, provide evidence that artist materials and dyes such as orchid, wood, kermes, indigo were imported into Ireland. Also imported were apothecary wares, uh, which may have included pigments uh, traded in small quantities. By investigating the material science of cultural heritage, we can piece together a picture of materials that were used, linking it with trade records and known practice in other countries. And also in the, in the diagram at the bottom, I'm showing um, the pigments identified by the team of Trinity College Dublin uh, in the Book of Kells. So it's very interesting to see that many of those materials used in the early Middle Ages were actually still used by Bartlett uh, later on in the uh, early 17th century. So to conclude, um, I just wanted to highlight that I hope you have, I have demonstrated the value of investigating maps from a material point of view, especially if we move from the single case study of iconic examples to the systematic analysis of a large corpus of maps. So we start seeing the bigger picture of their production context and identifying trends. This is possible thanks to new instrumentation available that is non-invasive, non-contact, highly portable and more and more automated. Uh, finally, I think, I hope I have demonstrated the interest of pushing the boundaries of our own discipline and start collaborating more and using the methodologies of other areas of research. Um, and I think that's all for now. I would like to thank you for your attention, very especially to the organizers of the seminar for the kind invitation. And I have a long list of people to acknowledge for their help with this project, as you can see on the slide. I look forward to your questions and thoughts, um, either now if we have the time or later through the email address shown in, in the slide. And I just wanted to mention that we have a, a book chapter in the making that should be published over coming months by Brill um, that will uh, discuss more in detail the, the outcomes of this uh, project. Thank you very much.